Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, this is David Feingold, the president of Chatham University and your host for the Future of Higher Education podcast on the New Books Network. I'm delighted to be here today with Richard Detweiler, president emeritus of the Great Lakes College Consortium, the former president of Hartwick College, and the author of the new book, The Evidence Liberal Arts Needs, Lives of Consequence, Inquiry, and Accomplishment. Rick, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, David. I'm delighted to uh, be here with you. Uh, could you start by telling us just a little bit about your own upbringing? Where, where, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Uh, I grew up in Southern California um, and uh, was the son of an uh, engineer. Uh, and uh, my, my mom was not a college graduate, but I, my upbringing was always, the expectation was always that I would go to college. So that was never a, a question in my mind. Um, and, uh, and so when it came to applying to colleges, uh, without much guidance at all from, uh, from schools or counselors or teachers or anybody, I kind of looked around and, uh, ended up applying to just a couple of schools. And I was most attracted to the school that had a, was on, right on the Pacific ocean, overlooking the ocean. The school actually had its own beaches. And I thought, gee, that'd be kind of a neat place to go to school. So talk about a informed way of, <laughs> of, of selecting a college. That was, uh, that was the way I selected. And what happened as a result of that is I accidentally attended a liberal arts college. I really had no notion of, uh, of, uh, the idea of, you know, specialized training or, or whatever. It was just, Oh, this is a, looks like a neat place to go to school. Um, and which it, one was it that you chose with its own beach? Yeah, it, at that time it was called California Western University on Point Loma in San Diego. Um, since that time, it's gone through a, a couple of mergers uh, and actually sold that campus to another college. So I have no, you know, strong sense of of, <laughs> of connection to the physical place anymore. But I have been back once or twice to just uh, look at the view, which uh, continues to this day to be. Uh, to be quite uh, quite spectacular. Uh, Great. Well, si- since you've become an expert on the liberal arts, just uh, would love you to reflect a little on what was the experience of that education for you, and then what did you go on to do in the in the early stages of your career? Yeah. What was uh, there? There were two aspects of that experience. One of which I greatly appreciated at the time. Uh, the other, I developed an appreciation of uh, a bit longer term. Uh, the first was uh, the faculty member, actually two faculty members, who in effect adopted me. And I don't mean that in quite the literal sense, but actually took a serious, real interest in me as an individual. I was a person who loved to learn, but didn't love classwork. Um, I would go to the library to study and was most more as likely to pick, pick a random book off the shelves and read that as I was to do the assigned work. But both of these, both of these professors apparently saw, saw something in me and really took me on one spent time, you know, talking with me, uh, thinking about what I was doing and what mattered. Uh, and the other, uh, basically made me his research assistant. So I began working very closely with him. And, um, so in, in those cases, it was really that engagement that they, they really cared about me as a person, uh, was interested in my development intellectually, but also, uh, personally what was going on uh, with my life and where I thought I was going. The, the other attribute that I did not appreciate at the time, but came to appreciate greatly as time went on, was uh, the, the the span of study, the subjects. I mean, I, I remember taking a, a a year-long world history course, which I thought was just abysmal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the reality is those those three professors who jointly taught it in small classes of you know twenty twenty five students, but they were talking about the the not just the political development or the wars uh, or the great leaders, but the social, cultural, economic development as a span of uh, de- development of humanity over time. And um, at the at the time, I I was kind of frustrated with that. But it, it very immediately began to have some uh, give me new insights, and that uh, that certainly, with time, I've realized that that course, among among many others, where I was studying outside of my own specific area of interest, really prepared me well for the life that, uh, in fact, was going to be ahead of me. 
Great. Can, can you share a little bit about, about your early career and when in that journey did you first think you might want to be a college or university president? Well, the the shaping experience uh, for me, my, uh, I, I married my high school sweetheart in my in our just before our senior year of college. So uh, we finished our last year together, and then went in the Peace Corps together, and uh, lived on a tiny little island in the uh, in the in the Pacific, the western Western Pacific, Eastern Carolina Islands. Uh, you know, very remote, very isolated. Um, the Peace Corps provided us what they called a book locker, about 50 paperback books, uh, which was the only source of communication or communication with ideas outside of ourselves, as well as, of course, learning the culture of the people. And uh, and during that time, I became fascinated with intercultural relations, something that I was I mean, the motivation for the Peace Corps was trying to do something worthwhile. Um, uh, certainly the impact on us was greater than, uh, than the life, than on the lives of the people, I think, and uh, over the long term. But, but, um, that fascination led me to, um, to decide I needed to go to graduate school and study this, how, how people in across cultural difference relate with one another. Um, I wrote a bunch of letters cause I had no idea what to do with that. So I wrote a bunch of letters to, um, the, the Peace Corps office, which was about a, a three hour boat ride away, had a had a directory of uh, graduate programs. So I found names uh, in there of professors at various schools. I wrote about 15 letters randomly uh, uh, and um, and uh, received two replies. One was from that professor I had in in college who uh, took me on. Um, and the second was from one professor at Harvard University. No other responses. I have to say it's not particularly surprising because the letters I wrote were written on a, on the one typewriter on the entire island. This was pre-computer day. And that typewriter was missing the letter E. So uh, <laughs> it was a big one. Every, every letter that I wrote, I had to handwrite in the letter E. <laughs> uh, at any rate, both, both my college professor and this professor at, um, at Harvard said, you should study social psychology. So I said, okay, I'm going to study social psychology. So applied using that same typewriter uh, to graduate programs. At that time, uh, not thinking at all about a career in higher education, but thinking about um, try, understanding people, how people relate to one another when they're not of the same background. Um, so I went through graduate school at, at uh, Princeton. Um, and uh, as I was getting into my final year there, you begin to say, okay, where am I going to go next? And uh, looked at academic jobs, but um, at that point, um, was very intrigued with the idea of going back to work for the Peace Corps as a country director. And so that's actually the job I applied for. I was uh, given that job, uh, but my wife t uh, turned out to be pregnant at that about that time. And the time I had to be in country, and that was non-negotiable for political reasons, was when her the baby was due. And this was going back into the Pacific uh, on an island with uh, no doctor, no medical care, no nothing. And I just decided I didn't want to miss the birth. Um, and so that, that stake was, was too high. So I canceled out of the uh, Peace Corps director job. And um, about that time, one of my uh, uh, graduate school colleagues who had accepted a job um, at one university was also offered a job at Drew University in New Jersey. And he said, well, I've already accepted another, I, so I feel bound to that one, even though I would really love to come to Drew instead. But my friend uh, is, uh, is now in the That's market. That's a nice and, friend, too. <laughs> exactly. So he handed them off to me, and we went and visited and, uh, and hit it off, and they hired me. So that started a higher ed, uh, a higher ed career. I taught. I, I was a professor for... Uh, for 19 years, but uh, but during that time there, about halfway through that time, I was there probably seven or eight years, uh, began to be intrigued, uh, not just with the the process of teaching and learning, but how is it that a, that a college or university works? And uh, a colleague there uh, of mine in, in the psychology department and I began to do research on what it was that makes an institution work and be effective and where is the future taking us? 
Um, and so we advocated and ended up uh, uh, convincing both the faculty and the, the president of the school and the board of trustees that every student should be given a, a, a computer. And this was a liberal arts college. This was in the days before uh, uh, there was a Macintosh or uh, Windows uh, ultimately came out, but this was the, the ancient days of computing. Uh, but we were convincing and, uh, and gave, uh, made the commitment to give every student a computer with the idea that it would be ed- useful educationally. Of course, that meant faculty had to be trained because faculty didn't have computers. Um, and so this got to be really complicated really quickly. And somebody needed to run that program. So they said, Rick, this was your idea. Why don't you run it? So I began running it and that worked out well and lots of excitement about that and distinctiveness, still a liberal arts college, but doing this techie thing. We were the first second college in the, in the nation to do that. And the first liberal arts college, um, the other school being a a technical school. And, um, And so since I could do that, then I began giving, being given other responsibilities and ended up being a vice president for planning and strategy at, at Drew. Um, And, uh, and that's where I was going. And I was not at that point in time aspiring. In fact, I would have to say I never aspired to be a college president. Um, I aspired to be in roles that allowed me to have an impact on, uh, and, and became more intrigued with institutional impact having an having a effects on lots of people rather than writing scholarly articles which frankly are read by few people and usually have very little impact uh so i was uh, nominated for a couple of presidencies one of those was hartwick uh, college in upstate new york and uh and they were looking for somebody who would uh, bring the future to that college in in a rural upstate location so that led to my my presidency uh at Hartwick. Um, and after, um, 11 or, or more years there, uh, was ready for a new challenge. I felt I had done the things I could do there. Uh, went to Washington DC, uh, with a think tank for about a year and a half. And then on to the, to the Great Lakes Colleges Association, which is a consortium, a group of liberal arts colleges. And the role of this organization, the GLCA is really to help them, deal with the changing world of higher education uh, through work with leadership, with presidents, with deans, uh, faculty, uh, and so forth to help them become more effective in going forward in the future. So that was really my the trajectory of, of my career. Again, not looking to be a president anywhere, uh, but, but keeping my eyes open for opportunities to, to broaden the impact. That, uh, that's a that's a great career summary. I, can you say a little more in terms of Hartwick? What was it that attracted you to them, and and mm-hmm. what were the things during your eleven years there that you were most proud of as your accomplishments at Hartwick? Right. Uh, so what what they were looking for was um, uh, to to uh, how should I say this? Get out of the ruts that uh that colleges typically get in uh and that is to say okay we you know we feel we have a good faculty we have a a beautiful campus overlooking a a river valley uh we're located in a rural location you know far from big cities and that makes it harder to attract people um uh so we want to uh i mean my sense of them is they wanted to preserve the the sense of the of the place as a caring educational institution, but move forward into uh, into the future in a way that would help them to be more effective and to attract students who would be looking for for that more uh, more complete educational experience. Um, and um, and clearly there were strong advocates to do what. Uh, what I had done at Drew, and that is to bring technology in. I mean, the president's ha- office had no computer. A few of the faculty had f- computers. And, and at that time, then that was way behind the curve. And that was kind of the sense is we're just kind of behave behind the curve on things. Uh, so we under undertook a big uh, planning process um, uh, to the great frustration of uh, some faculty leadership. I did not just on my arrival, say, okay, computers for everybody. I said, this needs to come out of a sense of strategic direction for the institution. So we carried out a a big planning process uh, involving 
faculty, staff, students, and and trustees, and uh, uh, and other significant people. And out of that, then um, developed a number of as we called them initiatives. One of them was uh, was technology based, uh, and so that meant computers for everybody, networking the campus, and doing all of the things that are today very common, but at that time even. Um, uh, networking was still in its earlier days, uh, and it, it was not uh, not as it is today. Um, uh, building on interest in and some programming uh, globally, a uh, great increase in the uh, global engagement of, of faculty and students, um, such that the uh, overwhelming majority of our students then over their four years had at least one uh, meaningful, significant study abroad experience, and we were among the top handful of schools at that time in the proportion of our student body who uh, who uh, had a study abroad uh, kind of experience. Um, so I think those were the the two that that kind of got the 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 public uh, public notice. Um, uh, at the same time, working to uh, strengthen academic program. Uh, areas in the curriculum uh, in which there needed to be uh, greater strength um, uh, was certainly a significant focus, as was improving the student residential facilities, building additional residence halls, uh, improving the availability of of um, things like fitness centers and so forth that make the the complete uh, complete college experience. And then it, as the broad umbrella, what I would say is uh, creating a culture of looking forward and saying what what are the where what is it we are doing why are we doing where is it taking us and not that that magically makes an institution uh quick uh uh, uh to endorse or embrace change uh, change is always hard on college campuses uh, but it was now a different kind of mindset uh that that certainly helped take the institution forward at that point in time. Uh, we also developed at that time, again, before it was, um, before it was common, a, um, it was funded by uh, one of our trustees. So we called it the trustee center, but really a career development center. Every student, when they came, was enrolled in that. It was a co-curricular experience. Um, uh, uh, students had, uh, had um, mentors um, of, from alumni uh, uh, shadow experiences with alumni, and uh, I think we were the first um, first school in the country at that time to offer a job guarantee. So we said, if you participate in these programs, and so this takes us back into um, twenty five years ago by now. If you participate in these programs, uh, uh, we guarantee that you will have a job uh, in an area of your interest uh, within six months of graduation. If not, uh, you can come back and take whatever courses you would like at, at and be at our campus at no cost to you. Uh, we never had to honor that promise because the promise actually did work with a 95% um, placement rate and the other 5% seemed to be doing something else with their life as <laughs> graduates sometimes do. Great. Um, you, you already touched a little bit on the GLCA. It's, it's a bit of an unusual organization among the different higher ed um, uh, sort of consortium of different types. Can you say a little bit about its origin and how did this grouping of 13 liberal arts colleges, how did it compare or relate to like the state-based association since these right. came from a, across the sort of Great Lakes region? Right. It is unusual. There are several others that are similar, but not really quite the same. It began about uh, 55 years ago by now, um, in which at a, at a time uh, prior to many of the higher ed organizations that currently exist, but presidents at that time in, in Midwest, uh, 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 Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, um, we're kind of looking around saying, you know, we ought to talk to each other. And um, because we're facing similar kinds of challenges and the, the world now in the, in the uh, at that time, 50s and into the 60s was changing. Uh, so they just looked around and figured actually 12 at that time. Here are 12 of us who are pretty similar. We're all smaller undergraduate liberal arts colleges. And so they, um, they just created this organization, uh, met at the Detroit airport, because that, at that time, people f could fly from lots of little cities all over the place into one place. And uh, so had an office there, but then found that that wasn't a good location. So moved, 
the uh, the hour away to uh, to Ann Arbor as the as the location, but from its outset, it was always a presidentially led organization, um, and always trying to look at what is going on in higher ed and what are the implications for us as uh, as as undergraduate liberal arts institutions. Um, it was small by by choice. There was always it was always in fact fixed at twelve. Uh, lots of schools wanted to join, but it was always no. This we want to be small because we can go know each other personally. So these now became uh, trusted relationships among presidents, among deans, um, and then as we developed faculty programs among faculty, and they were really could be could be uh, colleagues who could could work together in that kind of way. Um, uh, and then about uh, well in. Two thirds of the way through my my presidency, there uh, one college uh, kept knocking on the door and saying, "Look, you know, if you look at you, those your colleges objectively, and you look at us, we fit and we want to be in." Um, and uh, and so uh, we ultimately, after great contention discussion, finally the presidents agreed, "Yeah, we can add we can add one college." So uh, and that was uh, was Allegheny College in. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, so just over the border. Uh, yeah. So we became a, a an, an organization of thirteen. What distinguishes it from um, uh, other, like the state organizations that exist, is that it is there is it is not a political advocacy. It's not a policy organization. Everything is really focused on how can we strengthen education in the tradition of the liberal arts? How can we make our programs more effective? How can we, by combining resources or, uh, or interests, can we do things better uh, than if we are always doing things alone? So very programmatic, very strategic in its orientation. And uh, again, that was another opportunity when it came uh came to me that I was not initially interested in. I did consortial work did not sound interesting to me. Uh, but as, uh, and I had heard of the GLCA, but didn't really know anything about it. When I learned what it really was about, I thought, gee, this sounds exciting. I've moved from being a faculty member focused inward to a, uh, an, a college administrator looking at the, the whole thing of my institution sounds like a pretty nice progression to be able to say, let's, let's look at a collective and see if we can't can't make a difference uh, on behalf of a, of a larger group and have a, a greater impact that way. So uh, that, that led to my uh, 16 or so years at the GLCA. And, and how did you find the roles compared? Did that meet your expectations in terms of sort of the, the, what you found as the pros and cons versus being a university president, college president? Uh, y- yes, there were, th- there were th- several things that made it fun. Um, as you know well, well, I'll assume this is true. Uh, college presidencies are wonderful in many ways and frustrating in many in many ways. Um, you know, the the issues one deals with are not just the big issues, but all of the little issues that that you have to make uh, calls on or decisions about or have your have your uh, finger in the middle of. Things don't always go where you want them to go. Um, and, um, and that's, it certainly was not the case that everything just went as I wanted it to go, uh, working in a, in a consortial context. Um, but because the nature of the GLCA was to say, uh, let's be future directed, let's do things that are going to, going to make a difference. Um, there was not the kind of, um, resistance to change that happens within institutions where people ultimately always want to be understandably defending the thing that they care about, the thing that they're a specialist in. And so change can be very wrenching within an individual institution. You're talking about uh, people's lives and and jobs and uh, areas that they have real passion about. Working in a collective then, we weren't threatening any of our institutions. In fact, we were trying to take things forward. And where there were not ready colleagues within one institution, there were ready colleagues within another institution. So that that made it um, a f- much freer uh, environment in which to uh, to be thinking about the future without worrying about who, who you might be, uh, whose interests you might be uh, violating. Um, the frustrating part, again, absolutely understandably, is a college president's first loyalty has to be absolutely to their own institution. Um, uh, They are consumed 24 hours a day, seven days a week with their own institution. And so um, 
uh, so uh, the hard hard part is to was to keep uh, sufficient um, continuing attention of presidents. And it's not that we needed attention all the time, but we needed to have them be together with us from time to time as we were, uh, you know, deciding on direction, making major, uh, major uh, decisions about uh, where to go and what to do next and what priorities were. Um, and then they don't, didn't think about us until the next time uh, uh, I came knocking on the door, or we had a meeting uh, uh, convened. So, um, so again, there was nothing wrong or bad about that, but I think that was the, the most difficult part. We were, you know, uh, uh, found a, a substantial foundation interest in our work. Um, and so we always had plenty of resources to support our programs. That was wonderful. Again, very different than an environment in a institutional environment where you're oftentimes having to do in order to do this, you didn't, couldn't do that. Um, and, uh, and so that was, uh, was also, um, also, uh, very positive. Um, you know, sometimes I know, uh, uh, I annoyed, uh, uh, some presidents because we were going faster than they were ready to have us go. Uh, but again, that was, uh, that didn't mean that the organization was at threat. It just meant, okay, well, this school is not going to be involved in this, this thing we're doing because they're not, not enthusiastic about that. And that was fine. We still had amongst the collective of 13, uh, plenty of people and, and, uh, plenty of resources. So it was really, it was really, uh, a really fun, uh, a fun experience, great staff, people within the organization who were very much on board, very effective in their day-to-day -day relationships with people on campus. And um, so there was a really strong sense of teamwork, again, always forward looking. So a, a really, a really, a really good, good experience for the members, institutions, for the staff, and ultimately then for me. Great. Uh, love to turn to your, your book now. So t tell us the, the origins of it. What made you decide to write the evidence the liberal arts needs? And how did you go about getting the project started? Um, the, the beginning uh, was really the recurring challenge to liberal arts education. And that is uh, the myriad of people who say it's worthless. It doesn't do any good. You really need to get technical training. Um, and that was certainly that's, I, I've heard that from time to time over my uh, career in higher education. Uh, it was certainly being heard by our liberal arts colleges, uh, in the GLCA. And, and therefore that question was one, how do we think about or talk about the liberal arts in a way that will, um, that will be convincing that what we do really is, is worthwhile. So the, and, and what schools are typically doing is, is, uh, advocating for themselves on why what they are doing at their institution makes a difference in the lives of their students. The question for us at the GLCA is, could we make a bigger case that is a collective case? We're not just talking about the fact that uh, students at Chatham have a transforming experience and they live uh, in, uh, successful and meaningful lives. That's true. Um, and, uh, but, but could we make a broader case on behalf of what it is liberal arts education does? Um, so, uh, so in our case, then, uh, we began kind of asking that question, thinking about that. Um, and, uh, ultimately then I, uh, was able to, um, get the support of two, uh, uh two foundations, um, the Teagle Foundation and the Spencer Foundation, who, said that they were would be willing to fund a research project to try to understand better the liberal arts and its impact. Um, and that turned out in some sense to be the easy step uh, because then the next step is, okay, we now have funding to research this question of the liberal arts and its impact. So what is it? Um, and there are no shortage of books and articles and speeches on the liberal arts, um, which, uh, define it philosophers, uh, advocates. Um, but as I began to look into that, uh, things got, went from, uh, from complicated to just downright messy. Um, 
that is we in liberal arts education, and here I had spent my entire life working in liberal arts education, uh, and I had talked to prospective students about why liberal arts matters. And so we all have our way of talking about it. But the fact is, um, you know, there, while there are common themes there, there is no clear statement, no clear definition of what the liberal arts is. If you talk to humanities organizations, uh, and they were becoming increasingly uh, strong advocates at that time because of threats to their programs, they say, well, the liberal arts is the humanities, and they make that direct equivalence. Um, uh, AACNU, um, uh, Association of American Colleges and Universities, was working on a definition at that time, uh, but it was not, even the work they were doing then was not, in my mind, very operational. That is to say, it has to, if it includes this, then here are the kinds of outcomes that you can expect. There were things, there were values there that were important, uh, but but it was not a, a, a singular coherent uh, description. And by the way, well, everybody um, uh, said, yeah, that's nice. Nobody, or not nobody. It really, it's not that schools could suddenly adopt a definition and everybody would, would agree to that. You know, it, it, it contrast that to engineering. If you say engineering school, engineering schools all talk about what it is engineering is. It's very clear. If you talk about business school, that's really very clear. Here are the things you learn to do and here's what you can do with it. Liberal arts, that that was not the case. Um so uh, at this point in time, I began running workshops for faculty, for college presidents, for college deans, and having small groups de develop up uh, de descriptions of what the liberal arts is um, and, uh, and what it means. And what was fascinating about this, and I ran dozens and dozens of these kinds of things, is that the... Every group, when they would get done, you know, with a group of eight or 10 people, and I had five or six of these groups all working at the same time, they would come together and report out their results. And invariably people would say, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's the liberal arts. But their description and definition was not the same as the next group. It was not the same as the next group. And ultimately, uh, and that was true just over and over again. And and the best statement anybody could come up with was we see it when we know, we, we know it when we see it. And um, so how how can you then be an advocate for the liberal arts and say it has life impact if the best you can say is we know it when we see it. So uh, that set me off onto a, a, a personal journey, I guess I would say. And that is to say, I set aside all of that. I put aside the philosophy books and the, the, uh, the advocacy books and everything else. And I said, I need to understand what the liberal arts is as it has developed and been practiced. So what are the things that actually happen in liberal arts education? And I began with a, uh, one of the first things I, I realized having read widely is, um, the, the liberal arts, um, um, I knew developed in Greece and Rome, that was obvious. Um, uh, but then I found this guy who had written the, sort of the definitive description of what the, the liberal arts is, and he was a North African. And I said, well, how did a North African do that? Um, and then it kind of disappeared for a period of time when, the, uh, uh, when Europe uh, fell apart into what is sometimes called the Dark Ages. Um, um, uh, but then it came back again. So trying to understand what happened. So I went back and, and began focusing on the practices of liberal arts education. I don't read, you know, uh, ancient Greek uh, or Latin. Um, so I was needing to read uh, historians' descriptions. But I began to look at what, what, where did the practices of liberal arts education first begin and traced it back to what is uncomfortable for liberal arts uh, educators today. And that is, it was began to train by training warriors. Why did you, they need to train? Well, they need to do that, do that in a collective kind of way that was necessary to defend Greek city states. It made sense. Uh, I followed its development through, uh, through ancient Greece. Uh, and then with the, uh, the fall of Greece into Rome, um, and began to identify attributes of liberal arts education that were consistent over that time. Uh, uh, and I'll and, and followed it through into uh, into the Islamic Golden Age, which turned out to be very critical, and back into Europe, ultimately to to North America. What became very clear to me, not quickly, but as I 
worked through this development, looking at educational practices, what was going on was two things. One is that the educational experience was, the education was always happening in a, happening in a educational context, some kind of community. Now it might've been one tutor with one or two students, but there was a real honest, close relationship between that tutor and the students, or it might be happening in a, in a, a group of people coming together. Um, but it always happened in this meaningful, real, authentic educational uh, context. The second thing, the second attribute is it always focused on the broadest span of knowledge as it was understood at that time. Uh, now there, at the time it, it had its, its roots, there was not much span of knowledge. It was, we need people to defend this city. As Greek Greece evolved, we need people who can now govern and lead this city. Uh, and we be, and began to understand more and more topics. There were areas of inquiry, which we now call philosophy and so forth, and the arts. And so those were added. And over time, the subjects that were included also broadened. And the idea of that broadening of knowledge was if you're going to be prepared for the life that's ahead of you, you need to understand everything you can about the way the world and people work. And so that was the context, educational context, the educational content. And then the third attribute that was very clear was, was the, the purpose. Why are we doing this? And the purpose was always to serve the common good. Now, again, that's, that, is a, uh, uh, that is not a term I invented uh, by any means. But the idea was you were educating people to be of benefit to society and to themselves. It, it, we distinguish oftentimes today between, well, you need to have an education that the person can get a, you know, earn as much money as they can. That's the private good. That's the individual's good. Uh, we tend to have lost these days the idea that an education, although colleges still talk about, should educate people civically for involvement and contribution to society. But what I learned in this history is that it always focused on the common good. Training a warrior at that time did increase the likelihood that the individual would survive. It also increased the likelihood that the society would, would survive. Uh, as it grew into that democratic role and lead, leadership, then that contributed to the individual success. It contributed to society um, uh, and so forth. It, it, um, with, the, um, uh, with the decline of Europe, and the rise of, uh, of Islam in the Islamic golden age, again, long ago. But at that time, the growth of Islam, it, it is, it was, and remains a religion. But the, the first words of the Quran, uh, which are read, uh, was taken very seriously. And the idea was the one in, in Islam at, at that time, and among many Muslims today, the way you get closer to God is to understand the world better. And it was not uh, it was not uh, inflicting a religious view on every person. It was really reaching out to be inclusive of the broadest range of ideas possible. And during that time, then, there was a huge explosion in knowledge as, uh, as leaders of that time literally reached out as far as China and India, uh, down as far south in Africa as they could go, as well as the classical re classical work out of out of Europe, and brought as much knowledge together with Islamic and uh, and Jewish and uh, uh, and Christian scholars all working together, and you know uh, great advances in astronomy and math and medicine and the things we know about, and that ended up flowing back into Europe, largely as the result of a uh, of a um, pope a man who became Pope, who was actually educated uh, strongly by that Islamic golden age in what was then Islamic uh, Spain. Uh, and he began the flow of this much broader knowledge back into Europe. And liberal education then, as it was reborn in Europe, now didn't just include the, the classical Greek uh, philosophers, but it now included that far broader range of knowledge that flowed back into Europe at that time. Uh, but again, at that time, then the education was happening in the in an educational context. What were the first universities? There were places where people came from all over and lived together and worked together, and the professors lived there. Um, and so it was this uh, what I ended up calling an authentic learning community 
in that in that kind of environment. And again, the knowledge span of knowledge uh, continued to explode. Yeah. Ultimately, then, with the with the people coming to North America, the, the European settlers coming to North America, it was graduates of of Oxford and Cambridge who were in Boston who said, you know, we need to bring some of that here, and so they founded uh, the first uh, first institutions in North America pre United States, uh, at which they brought that same philosophy. Let's let's have these educational communities on the model of Cambridge and Oxford, and we'll study this large uh, span of knowledge at that time in order to make sure that we, the educated, remain in control. Uh, and it was not until after the American Revolution that the idea that this is good for everybody, is important for everybody, came along. So there was a fairly meandering report of of <laughs> how I, be I began to understand the practices of liberal arts education. Yep. And its purpose, as opposed to philosophy of education, and and so the the definition you settled on, looking at sort of those three core attributes of content, context, and and purpose, as opposed to, I think the way the term is often used, which isn't necessarily so much about the philosophy, but to distinguish between institutions, liberal arts yes. colleges, and yes. research universities. And so, yes. what's interesting in your approach is it allows you to look at to what extent do we find those three attributes in large research universities and in liberal arts colleges? That's as right. Traditionally, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so I'm curious as you as you think about that way of looking at it, and you look at liberal arts colleges as as is sort of used in the vernacular. How relevant do you see that distinction still today? Many of those liberal arts colleges, like a Chatham, actually have a high percentage of their students in pre-professional programs. You know, yes. they, they've added graduate programs. They, they've moved in that way. And so tell me how you think about the liberal arts experience in an institution that at least was originally founded to do it versus an experience within a much larger institution that has many other missions. Right. That's right. And, and that was, um, you know, I, I, um, at the outset thought that if what I try to do is just defend liberal arts colleges, then most people are not going to pay much attention or be much interested because there's been lots of tr attempts to defend what I needed to defend were the, were the practices of liberal arts education. And so in, in developing up the, the the ways in which the content and the context of education is defined, ended up uh, defining very specific practices. So then, then that allowed me to say, well, it doesn't matter what the institution is, those practices might exist. And um, it also could be the case that an institution that claimed it was liberal arts does not do much of those things anymore or now. Um, in which case they can claim that they're liberal arts, but they are not really. What I found in, and again, looking at these very specific liberal arts practices, you know, the, 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 the span of study, the nature of the pedagogy, the degree to which there's an authentic educational community and others there in ways that are very specific. Um, uh, could those, do those exist at any kind of institution? And the exams and the answer is yes, they can exist at any institution. Um, so, uh, so it's not per se a, a defense of liberal arts colleges, but ultimately late in the analyses, when I said, okay, where are you most likely to find these experiences? You're most likely to find, in fact, twice as likely to find those experiences at a small, um, uh, liberal arts committed institution as you are at another type of institution. So now, uh, I mean, I have three children, uh, Two went to liberal arts colleges. One went to an R1. Um, now, uh, when my my oldest, who went to Stanford, uh, went there, um, which was, of course, very exciting for her and exciting for us as parents. But I also remember talking to her and saying, you know, um, uh, develop a relationship with a professor. So some class you take, um, that professor probably has at least a one hour office hour sometime. Uh, and if you walk in that professor's office with a question from their lecture or read an article they wrote and walk in the door and talk with them, I'll bet that professor would be delighted to talk to you. Uh, 
And so she did that. And she found that strong mentoring relationship, a first name relationship with that professor, which most students in our ones do not have. She needed to take the initiative. She did. Uh, she had a happy experience with that. Not every student would, but that experience was there. And she found ways to have a, what by my way of defining the liberal arts, um, uh, a liberal arts experience there. Now, my other uh, two kids who went to liberal arts colleges, they didn't have to try to do that. That happened automatically. Uh, they were automatically involved in campus activities. The professors knew them by their first names. Uh, professors talked with them about, hey, you know, how's it going? Not just about class, but about other things. Um, uh, they needed to take, a, you know, some kind of a, a span of study uh, because that was required. So they got it automatically my other child got it because she took the initiative. And, and that's really how I would characterize it. If a person knows enough to know what to look for, they can probably find it at most any institution. But A, they're going to have to work to make it, to make it happen. And B, most of them are not going to know what to, to look for. So they lose the opportunity for the life impact that happens, not to every student who goes to a liberal arts-oriented institution, but that happens to the overwhelming majority. So that's where the distinction became important. Yeah. No, that's great. And of course, not every in child going to them has a parent who's spent his, their whole life <laughs> focusing on the liberal arts and the attributes and knowing what to look for. No, that's I, absolutely right. Yeah, I, I lost that battle with with our two kids who went to Harvard and Yale. And, you know, I used to describe them as, you know, they're like wonderful candy stores. You can make yes. of it what you want. If you yes. wanted, you could probably fake a student for four years, get them through as you, long as you turned up to take their exams. Exactly. And they could do fine. Or right. you, you, you can can really dig in and get to know the faculty. That's right. Um, yep. So so having taken that broader definition, though, you created a real research challenge. So you'd spent several years figuring out, okay, this is what we mean by the liberal arts. But yes. then you you did a really extensive data gathering. So you're over a, a thousand interviews of yes. students across all of these types of institutions. So how did you go about developing a sample that would be representative and where you would get that many people to talk to you and, and to ad actually gather the data? Yes. So um, uh, developing up the questions, how, so how do you, in research terms, operationalize these ideas uh, was a, uh, a work of more than a year all by itself. So, um, you know, non-vocational study, that one turns out to be pretty simple. Uh, but what do you mean when you say authentic community? Uh, so how do you define that? So uh, 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 for that process, I, uh, I convened groups of uh, college leaders and a faculty and had them work on these. What does it mean to have engaging pedagogy? Um, uh, what does it mean to develop larger perspectives in students? So came up with a set of questions about each of three kinds of educational context, engaging pedagogy, development of larger perspectives, and having being in an authentic educational community, and three aspects of the educational content, non-vocational, a broader span of study, and the development of intellectual skills. So came up with specific behavioral questions. So these were not opinions, but when you were in college, um, did you take more than half of your courses outside of your major area of study? Did your professor, how many of your professors knew you by your first name, um, et cetera? So, so those are the kinds of questions that, that we developed. Um, and uh, by the way, then the other set of questions had to do with the, uh, uh, the common good outcomes. So what outcomes do we need to look at? For this, I analyzed the mission statements of over 200 uh, liberal arts colleges and identified six life, common good life outcomes, leadership, what I called altruism, that's d involvement in community, uh, continued learning, being interested in continued learning, being culturally involved, uh, living a fulfilled life, and personal success, income, position on those things. So ended up with very specific behavioral questions about all of these. Um, and then the question was, how do we find that sample that you asked about? So we did two things. Um, and this was now all work done by a professional interviewing organization. Uh, this turned out to be a task that was beyond 
uh, the scope of a social scientist, which I am, of, of an individual social scientist. It, it took skill. So this is a organization that is very experienced in both developing these kinds of questions, pilot testing them, and then uh, and then uh, going forward with those. So our, we created the sample of, a, of over a thousand uh, in two ways. One is by um, uh, they, they then had access to these um, national sampling organizations that uh, that could create a nationally representative sample of graduates of all kinds of institutions. The dilemma with that was that uh, the problem with that is that um, uh, today only about 5% of people are graduates of liberal arts colleges. So if we didn't end up with, if we ended up only with 50 people in this thousand person sample, yep. we, we risk not really understanding that. So to that sample, we were given the access to the complete graduating uh, alumni group, uh, alumni of of a dozen liberal arts colleges. So we had over 30,000 names of liberal arts college graduates from which we randomly selected names. Um, and those were then interviewed by, uh, professional, uh, by professional interviewers who it turned out, I mean, there were questions like, how much do you earn? Which I thought nobody's going to answer that question. But it turns out when you're a professional interviewer and you put it at the right place in a relationship oriented, nearly hour long interview, people do answer that question. So they did. Um, and by the way, I, I left out of this the fact that we didn't want to just look at what happens when you graduate, but at life impact. So these people were ranged in age from 25 years old to 65 years old. And so we got graduates of all kinds of institutions uh, uh, randomly selected in two different ways with the second way, meaning to bolster the number of liberal arts graduates, um, and then use professional interviewers to carry out these, this questioning and, uh, and got a, a massive, uh, data set. And again, all of the questions were about their behavior. It, there was never a question, you know, did you, did, do you think it made a difference the, that you went to this college or that college? That was not the question. It is, you know, did, uh, uh, did professors know you by your first name? Uh, uh, were you involved? Uh, what kind of campus activities were you involved in? Those are very specific things. You know, um, uh, how for you know? How often do you vote for outcomes? Uh, how much money do you make? What is your position if you work in an organization? So, yeah. uh, and then the question became a statistical analytical question: Is there any relationship between the the experiences they had while they were in college and these? big categories of life outcome. Well, and just to tell you one other thing that could, could help with getting them to answer that, my wife's first job when we moved from England to the States was to work for Rand in their survey research group. And because she had a posh English accent, they found that American doctors, because she was doing the AMA's annual survey, were more willing to tell her their earnings than any American phone How interviewers. Funny. Oh, that is great. I love it. <laughs> so, so if you do a sequel, you know, you may Indeed. want to do some British. So, so <laughs> I'm curious with having done all this great work to pull this together, and thankfully for us, Liberal Arts University pre presidents founding a lot of significant, very significant relationships. Yeah. What were the findings that most surprised you, both in terms of those things that were really highly predictive of the successful outcomes and those things that didn't turn out to be very significant? Yeah, uh, I think I, I would say that I was relieved. I mean, since we had foundation funding for this project, I knew that if it didn't come out well, I couldn't just bury it. There was accountability to uh, to those foundations. So I was greatly relieved when there were things actually that that came out. What I would say overall that the most surprising overall comment is that the educational context was more consistently powerful in creating important life outcomes than was the literal content of study. Um, and so this educational community, meaningful engagement with other people, uh, exchange of thinking with students and uh, who bring different life experiences, uh, talking uh, not just in class, but outside of class, because you have those kinds of relationships about issues of significance to humanity. Um, uh, experiencing um, uh, engaging pedagogy that you can do in small classes where there's lots of discussion, give and take, uh, intellectual exchange. That about they th those were those um, educational context attributes. 
accounted for about two thirds of the important life outcomes. Those people were more likely to be leaders, to be more likely to be successful, to be community involved, to report living a fulfilled life and so forth. It's not that the content didn't matter. About one third of the effects could be traced to the content of study, um, especially to the, to the span of study, studying broadly outside of one's uh, major area of, of study. Uh, uh, being non-vocational in study, so not not being an undergraduate major in a in you know in in business or or um, uh, and so forth, uh, um, um, and develop writing papers more frequently, doing those things. So that was about the content was about one third of the time. And one of the reasons this is important is when people just sort of in normal day to day conversation talk about liberal arts, they generally are are talking about studying things they think of as not being practical, uh, art, philosophy, history, et cetera. But, but that's not really what the liberal arts is about. The impact comes from that educational community and the nature of the thinking that develops, not, not the, not, and so does humanities matter? Does studying philosophy and so forth matter? Can you have liberal arts without it? No. But is that what accounts for the effects? No. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on long-term life outcome, it was, it was really fascinating for me that if you want to predict, um, uh, highest income by the time you're, you know, 55 or 60 years old, two factors, one, taking more courses outside your major and two, having had close relationships with faculty and other students while you were in college. Those are the predictors of people who are more likely to be leaders of their organizations, presidents or whatever CEOs are more likely to earn, uh, to have higher, higher paychecks. And that was especially true. That was even more true. That was true for over overall, but for people who came from low socioeconomic families. So those students who, who came from families that were lower in income, that was, you know, uh, m- multiple times even more important for them as it was for, um, uh, for people in general. Yeah, I, I thought that that was a, a really striking finding. The other that really caught my eye, and I think it may have been the single most statistically significant impact that you had, was uh, actually, I think, harkens back to the way you described your own liberal arts college experience. The idea that you were close to 150% more likely to have had a fulfilling life if you're professor encouraged you to really challenge the strengths and weaknesses of your own worldviews. And I think that that particularly struck me because of the times we're living in where such divisive partisanship within the society, you know, really questioning our fundamental democracy and, and, and that that one kind of relationship could be so significant. Uh, no, you're absolutely right about that, uh, and that, uh, as you say, especially in these times, uh, that that really is important. I'm I'm curious, you know, you, a, a key motivation for you in in writing this was the crit- criticisms that have been there for a long time about the relevance of the liberal arts, and clearly the book provides a very compelling case that. It's not just something that can lead to a more fulfilling life, but as you just noted, you know, help to address economic inequality really create substantial positive career outcomes. Given all of this, um, what do you think historically liberal arts institutions can do to address the, the bad perceived name? Of it is—is is it still useful to use the term liberal arts? Can we get every American family to read your book, or how, how do we turn <laughs> the findings into something that you know we're all facing enrollment challenges, right? How do we leverage this to best yeah. effect? Yeah, I—I I, I actually think uh, two things. I mean, I—I I, I see the value of the book in multiple ways. As you said, if we could get parents and prospective students to read it, uh, which uh, I don't anticipate will happen. I tried to thread the needle and have it be readable or have portions of it be readable uh, to most anyone. Uh, uh, so I do think there is a way for institutions to look at themselves. I mean, you you meant in, in talking about Chatham. Well, Chatham now has graduate and professional programs. Does that mean you're not liberal arts anymore? Well, actually, there's there are indicators that you could now look at internally and assess yourself. Are these things still true of us? The reality is, um, you know, you can have a 
a, a nursing program. And if those students in the nursing program are required to have a breadth of study outside their major, uh, if they are engaged in the community in other kinds of ways, not just in the within the nursing program and in medical, et cetera, then everybody can still have that experience or maybe two thirds of your students do. So I think every institution has the ability to look internally. And if they do that, it gives them the opportunity now to market themselves differently. Uh, and it is possible now to say, because the book and its research exists, you know, we know that the objective research is if these things happen, if you really care about uh, a, a life of su personal success, if that's your motivator, here are things that we know from this assessment of a thousand college graduates. Here are the things that that are associated with that. And here's how we do on those things. If you're interested in uh, in being living a fulfilled life, well, here are the things that are related to that. And here's how we do. So I do think that there's an opportunity for individual institutions uh, to uh, to do that kind of work and begin marketing themselves based on their, what they do that's related to known life outcomes. And a given college doesn't need to do all of them because your mission may not be on all of those outcomes, but look at if it's leadership, here are the things that you know from this research impact leadership, life leadership, and here's how we do on those. So I do believe there's an internal opportunity for institutions. And if they don't like what they're finding to then strengthen their own programs in ways that create the outcomes they say in their mission they're trying to create. So that's, that's one dimension, look at strengthening and then marketing of an individual institution. I also aspire, uh, and I haven't yet figured out how to make this happen, but to have schools begin collectively to talk about liberal arts using similar concepts and terms. So move away from the from the rhetoric and and be able to to talk about again in my way of framing it content context and and uh, and um, and purpose. purpose. Yeah. Um, uh, and it doesn't need to use those three terms. Those aren't very sexy marketing terms, but to be talking about those things. And if institutions collectively began to focus on the nature of the educational experience and how that relates to life outcome and, you know, and step away from the, the, um, uh, the, uh, argument about, Gee, it's you know the amenities one has on campus, or the the all all of the kinds of ways uh, institutions try to differentiate themselves, and now feature their strengths in the content context and purpose, and and if liberal arts based institutions began to do that, and the public would begin to hear that, they would begin to both I think respond better to liberal arts colleges, and begin to change the way they thought about college choice. And, you know, and, and, um, uh, and uh, to when it comes to recruiting students to really not not be an advocate that our institution is 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 good for everybody, which to some degree, every institution is trying to claim. But to say, you know, to ask the question, what is it you would like as a result of your educational experience? And uh, and, you know, is it. Is it personal success? Well, yeah, students do care about that, but the research indicates that's not the whole story. Um, yeah, they want a job, and mom and dad want them to have a job. Yeah, they want to earn some money, but that there's more to life. They want to be constructively involved in society. Um, they want to live with a sense of purpose and fulfillment. And so reach to the student side and ask the question, what is it you're seeking in your college experience? That college is not a goal, is not an outcome, is not an end choice. It's a bridge to a future. And what you need to look at is where you want that bridge to take you. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then ask the question, does our college provide you with the kinds of life outcomes? Does the experience you're going to have here give you the life outcomes that really matter most to you? Well, Rick, I think that's a, a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I hope that the book has just those individual institution and collective impacts that 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 you're you're hoping for and and really appreciate you the huge effort that went into putting all that evidence together thank you david it's been a delight to talk with you i i very much appreciate your interest and uh, the opportunity to, to have this conversation